all these things suggest that the, the economy is slowing down. Market doesn't care. Investors don't care. All investors care about is, oh, inflation's beaten. Uh, the Fed's going to uh, cut interest rates. And of course, when the Fed didn't cut interest rates as quick as um, the market hoped, what we're seeing now is a, is a decent correction in the market. My view is that is just a, a correction that was waiting to happen purely because markets had gone up so far and so fast in a short space of time. And when that happens, you're going to get a reversal. And I think here we are with the potentially the start of the reversal. It shows that the amount of internally that the, the stock market is really stretched. And I think this is a, another potential sign that we might be at the start of a, a more prolonged uh, correction. Hello and welcome back to another episode of What's Not Priced In and today I am very excited to announce that the one and only Greg Canavan has finally rejoined the podcast. We haven't seen him on the show since early December 2023, now it's 2024, February, it's been a while. Greg, welcome back. Where were you? Kirill, how you going, mate? Well, um, we were just chatting beforehand and the show certainly didn't miss me. I hear the YouTube hits have grown, um, so I will be reassessing uh, <laughs> reassessing my um, regularity on this show and, and maybe the, the guests that we've had on will be uh, will be welcomed back a little bit more. But no, I've, um, I've been back at work for a few weeks but did have uh, obviously a bit of time off over Christmas um, and as you can see by the hat, Got a bit of tennis in, went to the Adelaide Open for a couple of days when I was visiting family over in Adelaide. Uh, that was a great little tournament. Um, if you're a tennis fan, you get very close to the close to the action over there. So that was good for a few days. Uh, and then um, on the way back home, uh, we stopped in at Melbourne for a couple of days and went to the Aussie Open, which we hadn't been there for quite a few years. We used to live in Melbourne um, and used to go there regularly. So that was uh, that was great going there for a couple of days and uh, I, I heard you went along as well mate on one of the weekends it's a good it's a good day yeah, it was it? it was a great tournament for a ground pass a lot of five setters lawn matches quality matches so highly recommend people to to go next year and I heard you were supporting yeah, good Cine, value so the old ground passes I heard you were supporting center so you've probably uh a happy household that he won. I was obviously going for the. Yeah, well, my my daughters are sinners. Uh, Yannick Sinner fans. They were. Uh, they they put up some. Um, they put up some stuff for him uh, in the Wimbledon uh, uh, tournament. Uh, he got to the semis there, and then my daughter left the Yannick Sinner sign up above the TV, saying that he was going to win the Aussie Open. So we've had her there for six months, and uh, she was right. So she was pretty happy. Yeah. But yeah, good uh, good tournament, yeah. definitely. Well. I spoke, uh, I, we might just get straight into it because I know uh, you've been back at work and hardly any sleep lately, uh, so I'm not going to talk for too long. But since you've been, since you, you're back, I sort of wanted to talk about your reflections on 2023 and we were just speaking off camera and something um, caught my eye because I spoke to, to Callum, who was on the show a few weeks ago, and I said to him that I've sort of, my 2023 reflection was that I don't really care as much about macroeconomic stuff because I just think that there's no there's no edge there for me. And you know, if if I'm looking for quality companies, it doesn't really matter what the interest is interest rate is or what the Fed is doing or what the Reserve Bank is doing. And interestingly, you seem to have a similar twenty twenty three reflection. So maybe you can talk on that and talk about what your goal for twenty twenty four is. Well I think uh it's a good point and macro stuff is really interesting because yeah. it gives you a talking point, right? So when you're talking about the market and obviously the, the Fed and the RBA does move the market in the short term, but does it uh, does it impact a, a company's intrinsic value? Not really. If you're using a, um, a standard discount rate over time that allows for the risk-free rate plus a, a decent equity risk premium, then at the end of the day, that that in that intrinsic value isn't really going to change depending on what the the Fed or the RBA says. So I'm in agreement with you. I um, am going to spend less time on thinking about macro conditions and more time focusing on individual stocks and what their long-term intrinsic value is. What I will continue to focus on, I think, remains really, really important is understanding what investor sentiment yeah. is at any point in the cycle. Because um, 
what generally happens and what has a big effect on price and not value is whether investors are excited or investors are depressed. And if you think about the past couple of months, obviously investors have gone from depressed in October and we've seen a massive rally over the past three months and investors are now really, really bullish. And we've got some stats that we can just point out to show where that bullishness is in relation to where it has been uh, over the past couple of years. And, And we're now at very extended levels. So one of the things that we often do on this podcast is look at things like the CNN fear and greed index, um, internals, you know, um, market breadth, that sort of stuff. Um, and, and that they are all really, really extended, um, at the end of, at the end of January. If you think about the news flow, so we've had all this stuff in the Middle East, you know, the, the, um, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, targeting, uh, ships in the Red Sea, which means that ships are sort of going around the long way, which is going to add to costs, um, that's been a big thing that the market has completely ignored. The market has completely ignored the ongoing slowdown in China. <laughs> you, you know, in times past, China would have had a much bigger impact on the market and on investor sentiment than it's had now. But because investor sentiment is so bullish, that just gets discarded, even though that is a, a genuinely um, something that investors should be looking at and should be considering in terms of you know how they're investing and and what their what the the results of that slowdown will be on the companies in their portfolio um you know things like ups which is the the uh Delivery. transport yeah. company in the us that um you know stock price fell sharply mm. this week uh, when it announced results there's companies that are announcing layoffs mm. left left right and center the oil price is struggling even though longer term i, I still you know really bullish on longer term energy prices. Um, all these things suggest that the the economy is slowing down. Market doesn't care. Investors don't care. All investors care about is, oh, inflation's beaten. Uh, the Fed's going to uh, cut interest rates. And of course, when the Fed didn't cut interest rates as quick as um, the market hoped, what we're seeing now is a, is a decent correction in the market. My view is that is just a, a correction that was waiting to happen purely because Markets had gone up so far and so fast in a short space of time. And when that happens, you're going to get a reversal. And I think here we are with the potentially the start of the reversal. Mm, yeah. Well, you've, you've spoken of the rally and uh, I've mentioned at the start that you, you, your last appearance was on December the 8th. And in that appearance, we talked about the Santa rally. And clearly the festive spirit has sort of dragged on now to to February, all those stocks are sort of correct in today. We're recording this on Thursday. But one of the snippets from that uh, episode in December was you talking about probability of the rally continuing. So I just quickly thought I'd um, quote yourself back to you and then maybe get your your thoughts. It probably won't yeah, be good. 2024, <laughs> Greg versus 2023, Greg. So you said, I just think everything is about probability. And I just think the probability of the Fed or the Reserve Bank pulling off a soft landing when you've hiked rates so sharply is quite low. I just think betting on this rally to continue is a low probability event. So what do you do you still agree with that low probability assessment? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I mean you look that was in what Early uh, December. When you say it was December. Um so we're not even two months into that. Um I would make no uh um, you know, claim to be able to forecast the market one or two months or six months or a year. And in fact, you know, going back to your comment on, it's not about forecasting the market. It's really trying to say, um, and and the other thing that I think investors should try to do is separate the market from their investments. Yeah. I mean, the market itself has gone up mm-hmm. in the US and that's really about seven massive stocks. So if you're if you're a stock picker, you can probably find lots of companies that are good value. And I know Callum, who's been yeah. on the show, is bullish about stocks, but he's he's looking at small caps, which haven't really done very well over the past couple of years. And absolutely, there are probably loads of good opportunities at that at that end of the market. Um, so uh, I guess the question was, do I still think that the probability of this rally? continuing is a low one. Yes. I mean, I'm not seeing a market that is genuinely good value. Um, and until I do, then I don't feel like there's any need to participate. I think with interest rates remaining high, like I think there's a, a, 
less of a chance of the market moving into a like a speculative blow off. I mean, I know a lot of people got excited yesterday with the the uh, better than expected inflation numbers uh, and the fact that the market broke out to new all time highs. Um, but often markets break out to new all time highs, and technicians will say that is bullish. Um, but I think you need to have the fundamental conditions in place that can create a sustainable rally after that breakout. Now I've looked at, um, I'm going to write about this more uh, in our uh, client um, note tomorrow, but just as a rough guide, I wrote down a bunch of stocks um, that are high quality, large cap stocks and their PE ratios. So you got Commonwealth Bank is on a P, this is 2024 PE, so the, the financial year that we're in now. Commonwealth Bank is on a 20 times PE ratio. I mean, that's that's crazy for a bank. Uh, CSL is on 35.2 times. Macquarie is on 20.4 times. West Farmers is on a PE ratio of 26 and a half times. Goodman Group, a uh, big industrial, sorry, uh, property um, owner, 26.3 times. Um, Aristocrat Leisure, 21 times. Uh, James Hardy, 25.2 times. Mm. Cochlear, 54 times. Car sales, th- nearly 40 times earnings. Seek, nearly 40 times earnings. Breville, great company, yeah. 32 times earnings. Uh, I could just keep going on and on and on. Like These are quality companies that are priced very, very richly in this environment. And I think that's just a reflection of a lot of um, money mm. gone into the market over the past couple of months chasing um, any company with earnings per share growth forecasts. But the valuations are just, to me, the risk and reward is not particularly attractive. So um, I'm more than happy just to to wait for the market sentiment or the bullish sentiment to, sub- to subside and then see what uh, opportunities get thrown yeah. up from there. And quickly on, on ComBank and car sales, I think both stocks we've mentioned on the show previously, previously especially ComBank and I think you've done multiple valuations across different episodes saying that ComBank is definitely um, overvalued, especially if you just look at something like return on on equity, uh, and especially if you do comparisons to other comparable big banks over in the US. So, And I yep. think just yesterday, CBA and car sales, I think both hit all-time high. So, um, yep. yeah. yeah, and they keep, why, they keep why going. Why do you think that is? is I think previously sort of wrote that, a lot of Aussie investors are maybe seeking certainty and obviously a, a, a bank like ComBank is definitely quite a, a certain performer. You, you know what, what you're going to get. I just think there's a big quality mm-hmm. premium being paid at the moment. So Commonwealth Bank, you can look at it in two ways. You can say uh, my sort of rough estimate of value is somewhere around 85 bucks, I think, from memory. Um, and you can either say, uh, and that's using a discount rate of 8%. So if you want to earn 8%, from Commonwealth Bank in the form of a dividend payout and the reinvested earnings that um, grow the business, 8% a year, that's what you should pay. So at the moment, the other way of looking at it is the market is saying, um, we're happy with, and I haven't looked at the numbers exactly, but I'm, I'm sort of thinking off the top of my head, it's probably closer to uh, say 6% um, or maybe 5%, or maybe five and a half, six. So the market is saying, look, in order to get the earnings quality, we'll... Uh, be happy with a lower, longer-term return. And I'm not saying you're going to lose your money. If you're a long-term shareholder in CBA, you're going to get your dividend. But at, at, at this price and based on the, the profitability forecasts that are, that are in, in, the, um, in the system at the moment, you're essentially getting a, a relatively low return compared to what you can get in a risk-free rate. So you're actually taking a decent amount of risk in, an, in a, a bank stock, a bank equity, and you're not really getting the return on that. So the market is happy to do that from time to time, um, but you don't have to be a part of that. You know, it's like the old Ben Graham adage that, you know, Mr. Market will offer you crazy prices sometimes and he'll offer you when he's very happy and optimistic and then other times when he's depressed, he'll offer you mm-hmm. bargain prices. You can or cannot take them. You don't have to. Um, and all I'm doing is trying to remain rational and saying, well, what would a rational investor pay? Um, and I'm really struggling for a lot of these really good quality stocks that you'd like to have in your portfolio really struggling to see where the where, where the sort of good risk re- reward um, prices are at these levels. And I think something that I like to say is, you know, high expectations make for high ledgers. So uh, the higher the expectations, the higher you have to fall if the expectations are not met and it's a disappointment. And Absolutely. I think... We saw yeah, that with uh, Domino's last week, right? Because you've written, 
recently written about dominoes and it, it fell i think 30 percent on a pretty um disappointing trading update so the market priced it in for yeah. steady growth overseas and that growth didn't eventuate and it, it fell a third of its value in one day it's great yeah well going into that uh going into that announcement it was trading on 40 mm-hmm. times uh, uh expected earnings for fy24 now those earnings have just been uh, slashed by about, I think from memory, about 16%. So when a company is, ex- when, when, a, when the market's expecting growth and it's pricing something at 40 times and then it gets rebased down to a lower level, that share price is going to fall hard. And I think that's what I'm sort of thinking from a risk reward perspective. If you've got a, a, a market that is still, or an economy that is still absorbing high interest rates from last year that are still ha- having a, a flow on impact, um, there is a risk out there that earnings are not going to deliver to the extent that the market hopes and expects they will. And I think that's where the risk is. And we're coming up to reporting season over the next couple of weeks. Um, so a lot of these richly valued companies, I think, stand out as being uh, high, high risk in terms of shorter term share price movements. Um, and look, if people have, have people have bought some of these stocks at much lower levels, um, you're going to, you know, you're going to ride them up. They're going to be down. The market's going to do that. Um, but as long as they're growing their intrinsic value over time, which most of these stocks are, um, there's probably no need to to sell out. You might want to, you know, lighten your load if you're, you know, if you're overexposed to any of the the particularly richly valued ones. But it all comes down to individual situation, what's your tax burden, all that sort of stuff. All I'm saying from a general perspective is I think you know the market is is pretty stretched here, and just judging by today's reaction, that slight change to uh, expectations in terms of interest rates and the fact that the big, uh, what do you call it, tech stocks reported pretty decent earnings and their share prices still fell um, indicates that there is quite a lot of optimism and expectation priced in at these levels. Well, speaking of optimism, and you mentioned um, investor sentiment at the start of the show, you sort of said you don't want to, you don't really care as much about macroeconomic readings, but you do want to focus on investor sentiment so maybe you can take us through where we are with investor sentiment let's do that yeah there's a couple of charts that um i want to share with you so this is the 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 typical one um you can see this hopefully the cnn fear and greed index uh when i first pulled this out in uh, yesterday uh, in the expectation of putting it in uh for the show it was at mm-hmm. 77 with extreme greed but following the sell-off in the us overnight it's come back down into the, the greed level but it has been up around this area for a while now um extreme greed uh one month ago so roughly from late i guess mm-hmm. late november uh up until now it's been in the greed or extreme greed reading um these other uh Intelligent investor bulls jumped to 57.7% from 52, which is the highest level since June 2021. And the Bank of America bull and bear indicator jumped to six, which is the highest level since July 2021. So obviously back then, uh, markets were very bullish, uh, swimming around in all the the COVID handouts and liquidity. Um, and we're back at those levels now in terms of you know market bullishness and enthusiasm. There's a chart here that um, doesn't get much airplay, um, and I put it showed it to my subscribers at the uh, the start of the month, or probably you know around the tenth of January, and I just thought it was a really interesting uh, chart. And it, it is the New York Stock Exchange bullish percent index, and what this does is shows um, the, obviously the percentage of New York Sto- New York Stock Exchange stocks, which there is thousands of them, uh, in in bullish. Uh, chart formations, and I think uh, it uses something like a point and figure chart to uh, to work out whether it's a bullish or bearish formation. Um, what's important is that when it gets below thirty, I think that's generally a buy signal uh, for the markets, and then when it gets up around sixty or seventy, it's generally a sell signal. Um, as you can see here, uh, at the start of twenty twenty three, um, July August twenty twenty, I think think that looks like. Um, Th- they were obviously sell signals um, in 2023 and clearly back here in 2021, it was getting very, very high. And then as the market, I, I haven't got an overlay of the S&P 500 here, but as the market continued to rise in late 2021, this bullish, 
bullish percentage index started to turn down, which was a bit of a, a divergence, which indicates that you know price is going up, but the amount of stocks that are continuing to be bullish are starting to break down. And that's often a sign that the internals of the market are starting to struggle. Here it's not so, well, I guess it is a little bit. The market, uh, so this is, it looks like the, the bullish percentage index peaked in late 2023. So this is roughly December. Uh, and then it started to roll over. And at the same time, the S&P 500 continued to move higher. So that's a little bit of a divergence there. And you're seeing that um, uh, the number of stocks that are that are continuing in their bullish formations are starting to, to, to head, head lower again. Now, if it follows these same paths from here, we can expect that to fall. Uh, again, and then we'll get, you know, potentially another buying opportunity in months to come if the if the market sentiment turns pretty quickly. Um, the last one I just wanted to show on that front. This is um, let me uh, try to explain this one. So the which one have we got here? This is the 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 brown line here is the ASX 200, and as you can see, broke out to new all time highs yesterday. Uh, and the blue line is the number of ASX 200 stocks within 20% of their 52 week high. And I like to use this as uh, an indication of the, uh, the percentage of stocks in bull market um, formation, i.e. you know, within 20% of their highs or stocks in a, in a bear market. So as you can see here, when stocks, um, when the level of stocks in a bull market gets up to, let's call it say mm -hmm. 70, 75%, that's when the market starts to get pretty, pretty stretched. So here it reached that level in June of 2021. And if we go back to the, the sentiment indicators, they were hitting their peaks back then in the US. And that obviously reflected in strong sentiment in Australia as well. The ASX 200 peaked in August of 2021, um, went sort of down sideways, corrected back up to uh, high levels in April 2022. Um, the percentage of stocks, though, were falling. So that sort of is a, a non -com a confirmation that that wasn't really a, a sustainable rally. And obviously, it's fallen fallen down there. Stocks rally, um, st stock market rallied up again, along with this indicator. Um, and really, it's just a sign that every time you get the number of stocks in in really bullish formations up above, say, seventy five percent, the market starts to starts to struggle and we're, we're seeing that here the number of stocks yesterday uh in bullish format uh bullish um i guess trends uh 77 percent uh and the market hit new all-time highs but that's going to turn down today so it, it just shows that the amount of internally the, the the stock market is really stretched and i think this is a another potential sign that we might be at the start of a, a more prolonged uh correction nothing to you know, I'm not sort of saying that we're in a collapse or anything like that, but I just think a lot of the heat uh, will potentially come out of the come out of the market over the next, uh, you know, whether it's the next couple of weeks or the next month or two months, who knows? But we've had a really, really good run over the past couple of months, even though, as we just said earlier, there's been a lot of underlying uh, economic issues where there's um, geopolitical China. You know, visible signs of US slowing. And at the end of last year, I remember we showed the divergence or the non-confirmation of the Dow Industrials Index versus the Dow Transports. And that's still, I haven't got that on chart today, but that's still in force. The Dow Transports are well below their all-time highs while the Industrials have gone to new all-time highs. So another um, non-confirmation there that we should be cautious yeah. of. Well, I had a quick question. You, you mentioned that the A6200 hit its all-time high, high yesterday i think the s the uh, s p 500 did too but I, I did have a question because a big portion of, uh, of why the the um, s p 500 us stocks are surging higher last year and, to, and this year is because of the massive tech stocks the magnificent seven like the microsoft's and the apples and yep. nvidia's and whatever uh we don't necessarily have that in australia and so for example if you take away those magnificent seven from the S and P five hundred. It's not doing spectacularly. It's its gains are almost equal to, for example, European shares. So the S and P five hundred equal weight isn't exactly. It's it's still rising, but it's not rising as much as the yeah. for example the Nasdaq one hundred. So my question is, we Australia doesn't have the big seven, 
So why is it hitting all-time highs similar to US stocks? Well, if you think about it, it's only just popped its head above Mm -hmm. the all-time high from August of 2021. Um, So I don't think you can really put it in the same league as the S&P 500, which is significantly above where it was in August 2021. Um, The Aussie market has just gone sideways for for a long time. Um, You know, what you want to see after a a breakout – and, you know, potentially we, we might get it. We might just get a, a correction back down and then, you know, on, ongoing uh, bullishness again and, and more um, the index moves higher. But from my perspective, because the index is so weighted towards mm-hmm. the banks and the big resource companies, um, I, I could be wrong on this, but again, probability, if, if China's really struggling, I don't see how iron ore prices remain yeah. as high as they are. I, I'm actually surprised that they have held up uh, as well as they have. Um, so then that puts a question mark over whether the big miners can continue to rally and, and continue to make new all-time highs. And just from the banking perspective, you know, the banks aren't necessarily going to go um, pear-shaped, but are they going to continue to rally in an environment where the RBA is going to stay, keep rates um, high? And if they do reduce rates, it'll be very... Uh, slowly and bit by bit. Um, and if they do reduce rates quickly, it'll be because the economy is showing real signs of stress. Um, and, you know, just last night, uh, the name of the bank escapes me. I think it was New York. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One of the smaller New York banks, it reported a surprise mm-hmm. uh, increase in its provisioning for bad loans and it had to cut its dividend. Uh, not entirely. I think it just reduced its dividend. But that bank share price fell 36% last night in the US. Um, so when economy economies slow down, banks are under pressure to uh, provision for yeah. potential losses. Um, and, you know, the banks are well provisioned in Australia, but th- when that cycle turns... Um, and they take those provisions through the income statement, then that reduces their earnings and it reduces their return on equity. Um, so again, you know, Commonwealth Bank at nearly 120 bucks a share isn't really giving you much protection against that potential yeah. outcome uh, for the, the whole banking sector. So I just look at it from a common sense perspective and say, well, what needs to happen for this breakout to mm-hmm. continue? And um it needs to. It needs the big stocks to to continue rallying, and I just I'm not. I, I can't see how that's 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 yeah. going to happen. Well, well, speaking of a slowing economy, I think harkening back to our uh, original episodes where we talk about uh, macroeconomic readings from the Reserve Bank or the ABS, I thought I'd briefly mention some because you were sort of saying you know it, it doesn't really make it's a hard habit. Here we kick, go. Uh, obviously, we had the December quarter CPI. Most people probably already know it. Um, the interesting one was at um, at one point two percent. It was the smallest quarterly rise since March twenty twenty one. So some people probably think, "Hooray, inflation is coming down." Others might say, "Well, maybe it's a sign of a weakening economy." And uh, an argument in favor of that is that retail sales tumbled in December too. Uh, so I think yep. Australian retail turnover fell two point seven percent seasonally adjusted in the month of December. Um, it was, there was a spike in November, but the December fall definitely more than offset that. And actually check the numbers, uh, the December retail turnover fall was, um, I think one of the lowest readings since August, 2021. So that's, and when, so that's not a good sign. We've also had some goods deflation. So people talk about, you know, it, we need inflation to slow down. In some cases we're actually got good uh, prices of goods falling so prices for clothing footwear yep. furniture and household appliances are actually lower now than they were 12 months ago uh so that's maybe good news for some some shoppers but not so good for retailers and obviously we had uh the vacuum merchant godfrey's i think uh, in voluntary administration it's been around for for decades so that's unfortunate there mm-hmm. um and obviously, Aussie real disposable income fell 5.5% since early 2022. So um, the Reserve Bank releases like quarterly bulletins where some they uh, do some research there. So that's, I, I picked it up from there. And that was the largest fall in three decades. Uh, and I think the Reserve Bank also said for the median uh, household mortgage 
owner, real disposable income is estimated to have fallen by 15% since early 2022. And so high inflation, higher housing costs have more than offset any labor income growth. So if you look at that... Well, don't forget the, uh, yeah, the bracket, and also, bracket yeah, tax creep as well. Creep I mean, the, as well. The, so if you look at all of that and take it together, yeah. it doesn't maybe really make sense that the ASX 200 is hitting all-time highs yesterday when underlying all of that, you know, real disposable income is down. Some goods, we actually have some goods deflation because people aren't really buying that much goods. And that's because probably they really can't afford it or they're just delaying it until maybe things improve. So there's, there's cracks there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only caveat I would say is that the, the market rarely makes sense when it makes important yeah. moves, you know, like, um, you know, market breaking out to new highs doesn't make sense, but it keeps going. Um, you know, market um, is cheap and keeps going lower. doesn't make sense, but it keeps doing it. Um, so often, often what the market does doesn't make sense. And I wouldn't worry too much about trying to make sense of it. I think, as I said at the start, the best you can do is try to uh, look for stocks, understand what the valuation of those stocks are, what their long-term prospects are, and focus on whether you're buying them at the right price or not. And, um, you know, have a lesser concern about what the market what the market itself is doing because you can't you can't yeah. work that out and i think you in your recent dispatch to your clients at fat talent investment advisory actually wrote about that you sort of mentioned that you're going more towards just focusing on on stocks good companies and their valuations and you've um you quoted peter lynch who actually just have callum and newman there trying to distract me <laughs> and he's gone but anyway uh, I was saying that yeah, in your recent uh, note to clients, you were talking about boring stocks. And so the, you were sort of uh, quoting Peter Lynch, who said you know, he, he sometimes doesn't care about the hype. So, for example, like AI or something, he just wants to find a perfectly good company with a perfectly good business model. And, you know, the more boring the, the, the business model, the better in some cases, because it just sort of steadily grows its earnings, uh, keeps reinvesting and, you know, there's no no drama. So... Is, is that sort of what you're focusing on now in 2024? More about good businesses, less about macro. Yeah, I think. I mean, look, that's roughly what I do for subscribers every every month. Anyway, I'll pick out, you know, pick a a, a good stock. Um, but I did. I read uh, the one up on Wall Street over the holidays, and and you know, it really resonated with me that you know Peter Lynch was talking about uh, his perfect stock being uh, a boring company with a boring name in a boring industry. Uh, and the reason why I think he said it was it, it's perfect for him is because there's no hype yeah. around it. When there's no hype around it, you don't you, you tend to get good value, or you tend to be buying it at a price that is going to reward you for holding it over a number of years or, or whatever. Whereas if you're buying into a sector that's popular or hot, then you're generally going to be paying overs for it because people are interested in it and they're bidding it up through uh, the natural natural course of optimism um, and that's how the market works so yeah the the, the idea of a, of a boring stock with a boring name um, did resonate with me and I found a boring stock with a boring name that is off 25 percent from its highs last year uh, the market isn't really interested in it um, and lo and behold it's actually good value compared to a lot of the other stocks out there so uh, it was a, it was a, to me, it's going to be a good, good long-term pick. And you've sort of mentioned that some quality companies on, on the SX are overvalued and you've rattled off some names. So, but then you did say that, you know, you found that this particular stock that's looks like good value on balance. Do you think right now the SX is a good hunting ground for value investors or are you sort of just taking a wait and see approach? Uh, look, I think right now, purely because so many stocks um, have rally. And look, at the end of the day, when sentiment is really, really bullish as it is now, and then when it turns to bearish, nearly every stock will yeah. get caught up in that shift from from bullish to bearish. So um, again, it's more it's more of a short term uh, uh, consideration where I think I'd rather I'd rather buy stocks when they're not. Uh, yeah buoyed up by this idea it's almost like a fomo you know everyone's thinking oh crap I, the, the rally's been going for two months if i leave it any longer i'm going to miss out when you have that type of attitude you know it, it is yeah. tempting to try to follow that um and and think okay i've got cash here it's doing nothing all the market's going up i need to i need to join in i need to be a part of it but 
um, again, it comes back to what does the rational investor do? The rational investor tries to buy at prices that he's going to give you the long-term return uh, that you're after. And uh, often when people are buying in these environments, they're not looking at valuations. They're maybe putting money to work via an ETF. An ETF will allocate funds based on the percentage um, that of, of the index rather than any valuation metric. So I think just in this environment, a lot of buying happens that isn't related to, to rational common sense investing. And it's more to do with um, FOMO and emotions. And uh, when that happens, I think you can stand aside and wait for that to wait for that uh, emotion to come out of the market. And that's when you'll get uh, much better yeah. prices. Well, speaking of, you know, big expectations and FOMO, I think there's a lot of FOMO in AI investing. I was just reading um, the the valuation guru, I think Damodar, and he's, you know, he wrote, he re- read, wrote all the big books on valuation. He has a, a course in, on the New York University on it. And he once published an article called The Big Market Delusion, where he was sort of warning investors against um, just looking at an expanding industry and just hopping on any stock in that industry purely because the industry is expanding. And I'll just read a, a brief quote from him and maybe just get your thoughts on, on, the, on the AI industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said, the peril of a big market, especially in its early stages, is that the entrepreneurs it attracts and the investors who provide funding are often so enthused about the prospects for dramatic growth that they ignore fundamentals and price their companies with unrealistic expectations about the future. And sort of that sort of ties nicely into what we talked about before, where, you know, if you if you price something to perfection, you know, any tiny disappointment is enough to, to move the, the stock much lower. So do you think there's a, a risk of that playing out in, in AI? Is there a risk that, you know, people think it's going to be a, a gigantic market that people might get maybe diluted into bidding up the price too high and for, forgetting fundamentals? Uh, <clears throat> good question. And for me, I, I don't understand. Um, I don't understand the the mm-hmm. market well enough to to try to work it out. Um, but I think there are definitely going to be some winners, um, and there'll definitely be some losers. And you really need to need to um, be on top of the the sector, the market, the technology, uh, and and have someone who uh, you know are, are making yeah. considered bets in there. And they are bets to some extent, right? Because the new technology, you don't know how it's going to be used. You don't know who's going to benefit from it the most. Um, and that's just how a new new market that grows is. There'll be plenty of winners though. Um, and it's just a matter of getting on board with them. All right. And I'm not sure which ones they are. So we'll, uh, don't ask me. <laughs> yeah, but you can ask uh, Ch- Charlie and Ryan because they're the, they're the tech AI guys. Absolutely. They've got a lot better yeah. idea than what I well, do. Well, before we go, I think maybe one final question. And it's, you know, you've been away from the podcast for a while. Have you um, read any interesting books? You've obviously mentioned Peter Lynch's one up on Wall Street, but um, you know, New Year, new new reading goals. What what should people be reading? What have you been reading? Well, I just got a couple of new ones, and I haven't read them, mm-hmm. so I can't really speak to them. But I just got I've seen this that in one, bookshops, so yeah. that could be interesting. Um, turning ordinary moments into extraordinary results. But I, I have read a lot of um, mm-hmm. good reviews of it, so I thought I'd give that a go. And uh, this one's not necessarily new, but Howard Marks is a favorite of mine. Yeah. I love reading his memos. Howard Marks from Oak Tree Capital. Um, and this one is called Mastering the Market Cycle. Uh, and Howard talks a lot about, um, I guess, bigger picture mm-hmm. macro stuff, but all, also um, very much about the psychology of investing. And I think, to me, that's the, the most important part. And it does have a little uh, bit from Warren Buffett on the background and back of this, and it says, when I see memos from Howard Marks in my mail, they're the first thing I open and read. I always learn something. So, you know, if Warren's endorsing it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty good. Also, I should point out, I've been, um, been catching up on a lot of Charlie Munger's stuff. Um, I hadn't really followed him for a few years and then obviously he passed away at the end of um end of december um huge intellect uh you know a huge amount of things to learn from him so uh, one of his sayings was something along the lines of uh you should always learn from the eminent dead 
uh, and with Charlie having passed away, I would consider him probably one of the most yeah. eminent dead people in the world uh, and plenty to learn from him. So I've been getting into listening to interviews, um, reading some of his back catalogue, uh, and, and hopefully we'll be, we'll be talking about that in the future as well, just because he's such a, a genius of a guy and clearly his work um, and the legacy he's left is, is almost second to none. So, um, yeah, that's a few things yeah. to leave you with. Well, personally, I, I've been reading this um... – this, this niche book about uh, a DuPont scandal. So DuPont was, is this big uh, chemicals company and, and over in, in America, I think in the early 2000s, they got sued for, for billions of dollars because they were releasing this chemical that was used in Teflon coatings and that was sort of percolating through US citizens' bloodstream and, you know, the toxic, I think the book was called Exposure. It was written by the lawyer who took them to court and it was just interesting how he sort of, piece it all together reading all these documents so i'm always fascinated by that type of stuff so yeah check it out exposure what are we what are we talking back in there nine early 1900s or mid oh, no, so he's he, that that lawyer took on the case in 1998 but it took him years to actually oh 98 yeah, took him years yeah right okay but i think the the um interesting that, that teflon coating they were using it for decades before that so that's why it was such a huge scandal yeah. because I think a lot of Americans got exposed to it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Well, there you go. Uh, Greg is back. There you and go. Uh, are we going to see you next week? Not for long, though. I'm going to get get the other guys back yeah, on. Well, because, uh, you know, I, w- I was sort of saying for weeks now, oh, Greg is back next week, Greg is back next week, and every time with someone else I was made to look like a liar. But you're finally back and maybe see you next week. Well, let's have a look at the uh, the viewers this <laughs> okay. week, and we'll grab someone else if it's All if right. it dips. <laughs> All right, no worries, Girl. Thanks, mate. Thanks for listening, everyone.